Amen. I'm getting up. I, I needed a song just like that this morning. Thank you. That's wonderful. Praise the Lord. Well, I remember when, when I was young, and I know that's hard to imagine, uh, but, uh, and I heard a, heard a preacher, thank you, sir, thank you, who just turned 70, and he said to his wife, he said, honey, I, I don't look 70, do I? She said, no, you used to. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when, I was, when I was young, I remember on Saturday nights, I would come into an empty church. I would st stand behind the pulpit, and, and I would practice my sermons. So I used to have a Saturday night service uh, before having a Saturday night service was cool. And I got to tell you, uh, it is a lot more fun when you're here. It really is. Yeah, I don't know why, but people seem to make a big difference. And I'm glad that you are here today. Uh, how many of you are here, by the way? Pretty good, pretty good crowd, I'd say. Uh, and f feel free to let me know that you're here. I mean, if you hear something that just rings true, something that blesses your heart, it's okay for you to say amen, or you can, you can raise a hand, or maybe at least smile at me and let me know you're there. Um, you can throw money at me. That, that always works. That works well. Now, not, not the hard stuff. You know, I don't want to get hurt up here. I'm talking about the kind of stuff that you can crease and, and wad and, and throw. So feel free. Feel free to do that as well. Well, it is a great privilege and joy this morning to talk about one of the I Am statements of Jesus. That's our sermon series. Many times Jesus gave that kind of declaration, laying claim to a very special truth about Himself. This morning, uh, our theme, uh, Jesus is the resurrection and the life, it is found in John's Gospel. And uh, we're going to be focusing on verse 17 through 27, but let's go back to the beginning of the chapter for these introductory words, John chapter 11. We're told that there was a man named Lazarus, and he was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister, Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. We pick up in verse 17. Uh, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Mary heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, you're looking at him. I am the resurrection and the life. Without me, there is no resurrection. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. All the writings of John are an unveiling 
of Jesus. That's really what the word revelation literally means, the apocalypse, the last book of our Bible. But John's letters and John's gospel are a beautiful unveiling of Jesus. It's a record of what our Lord said and what He did, a record that shows us who He is. And that record is never more beautifully presented than in our story today. The story begins with the introduction of a family, sisters and a brother, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We learn a lot about the brother in just a few verses. We learn that his name is Lazarus. We learn that he was sick. In fact, his sickness is such a prominent theme here, it's mentioned three times in the first three verses of this chapter. We learn that he was from Bethany, a small village about two miles east of Jerusalem. And we learn that this sick man, Lazarus, from Bethany had two sisters, Mary and Martha. All of that in verse 1. In verse 2, we are told that he lay sick. Sickness had overcome him. He was seriously sick. But then we are told in verse 3, that he was loved by Jesus. Lazarus was also loved by his sisters, and they were very worried about their brother. So they sent word to Jesus that their brother and his beloved friend was desperately sick. Now, I see three settings, three snapshots of Jesus in this story. Each one paints a particular picture. Each one tells its own story. First of all, I see Jesus waiting. Jesus waiting. When he gets word that Lazarus is seriously ill, one would have thought, and I'm sure Mary and Martha thought, that he would drop everything and leave immediately to come to Lazarus' aid. And yet... And that's the word, by the way, in verse 6 that introduces us to his response. Yet, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. The response of no response, this action of inaction, this hurry up and wait, lends itself to misunderstanding and misinterpretation. And surely, Mary and Martha were perplexed by the Lord's delay, His hesitancy in responding to their sent word that their brother and His beloved friend was so sick. You know, even today, God's timing is often shrouded in mystery. We are left with questions to which only God has the full answer. In a real sense, I think we could say that Mary and Martha had prayed to Jesus. They said, Jesus, Lazarus is sick. Jesus, please come. Jesus, heal our brother. But they did not get the answer they expected. And oftentimes when we do not receive that for which we pray, we say, that our prayers are not answered. What we really mean is we didn't get the answer that we wanted. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. And sometimes God says wait. And wait was the answer Mary and Martha got. And wait can be the hardest answer of all. God doesn't say wait to hurt us or to punish us, but to teach us and to help us grow. Sometimes there are lessons to be learned in waiting that can be learned in no other way. God's delays are not God's denials. Wait doesn't mean no. It just means wait. God has a work to do in the waiting. Jesus, in fact, makes it clear 
There is destiny in the delay. There is purpose in the pause. There is worth in the waiting. Note verse 4, if you would, in, of course, John chapter 11 here. When he heard this, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. There are times when the greatest good will be found in waiting. The greatest revelation will be given. The greatest truth will be discovered. The greatest character will be developed. Waiting for answered prayer, the vindication of our faith, can lead to doubt and disillusionment and false thinking and false theology. Waiting is hard. Nobody likes to wait. God's waiting room can be agonizing. When you wait, your mind can entertain the worst thoughts. And the enemy, the liar, the accuser, will look for those doubts, and doubt will be an opening for him to whisper, see, God doesn't care about you. God doesn't even know about your problems. God has no idea what your address is. I've heard that voice. I've heard it while being put on hold. I've heard it throughout the night and throughout the day, day after day, Calling heaven and being put on hold is like calling suicide prevention and being put on hold. Charles Spurgeon, noted preacher of the 1800s and a close personal friend of mine, (laughs) said, God is too good to be unkind, and He is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace His hand, we must trust His heart. Sometimes God has a plan we cannot see. We cannot connect the dots. We didn't even know there were dots. But like unseen stars, God sees the dots. He sees all of them, and He connects all of them. And when they are connected, they make a beautiful tapestry of his hand and his heart. A strange statement here, staked right in the middle of this story. Yet, he stayed. A divine, purposeful strategy, unknown to his friends, unknown to his disciples, known only to him. And his delay will be the very material Christ will use to build the theater that will showcase God's glory and his wisdom and his power. I see Jesus waiting. Secondly, the second scene or snapshot, I see Jesus weeping. Jesus has arrived in Bethany, and by the time he gets there, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Now, there is significance in that. You see, there was a Jewish tradition that said the soul hovers around the tomb for three days hoping to reenter the body, but on the fourth day, it departs. Now, Jesus didn't believe that, but some people did. And in waiting for four days, Jesus knew The certainty certainty and the finality of Lazarus' death would be clearly known and accepted by everyone. So he comes to the tomb, and there he is met by Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters. Along with the mourners, they make their way to Lazarus' grave. And verse 35 says, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in all the Bible and the the only one that many have committed to memory. And some of those think they are now experts on the Bible. And that short little verse preaches so many sermons. Why did Jesus weep? 
Well, I think, first of all, and it's pretty obvious in the story, he wept because he loved Lazarus. Verse 3, Lord, the one you love is sick. Verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Verse 11, he calls him our friend, Lazarus. And his love for Lazarus was no secret. In verse 35, verse 36, Jesus wept, and then the Jews said, See how he loved him. The connection was obvious. Jesus had lost a personal friend. He wept as a man. He wept as a member of the human race. He wept as a friend, weeping over a lost friend. He wept because he loved Lazarus. I think he also wept over the sorrow of others. Jesus wept. In verse 33, he was deeply moved. And in verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved came to the tomb. Jesus is not some wound-up robot sent from heaven. He's not cold and calloused. He's caring and compassionate and capable of feeling and weeping. He sympathizes. Throughout the gospel accounts, we have the record that he was moved with compassion. He's presented to us in Hebrews as a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. So these were tears of sympathy. If they were any reason for his tears, certainly sympathy was a prime one. Verse 33 says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. The tears of others were a catalyst for his own tears. And what he saw and what he heard at that graveside triggered a reaction of sympathy within him. He hurt over their hurt, and he, he wept over the sorrow of others. Then I think the Lord wept because of the sorrow he felt over death, death's reign. He understood that as no one else could. He had a perspective no one else had. Lazarus' death was just a small part of a much larger story. In fact, a part of our story, a story that goes back to Satan and the garden and Sin and rebellion and the fall and the curse, a curse that had left all of humanity in the throes of sickness and sorrow and death. And as he stood by Lazarus' grave, it was just a reminder, a vivid encounter with the reality of a fallen world, a human race caught in its own trap. Know oh, the countless numbers of those who have been taken captive by this ageless enemy, death. Death seemed to have the upper hand that day, the final word. But another chapter is going to be added not only to Lazarus' story, but to every believer's story. Jesus waiting. Secondly, I see Jesus weeping. And then thirdly, I see another picture, another snapshot in this scenario. I see Jesus working. It's time for Him to roll up His sleeves and do the God thing. It's time to take action. It's time to step up and speak out. It's time for Him to tell death where to get off. He waited. And in his waiting, he showed his wisdom. He wept, and in his weeping, he showed his compassion. And now he will work, and as he works, he will show his power and his authority. So step aside and watch the Son of God be the Son of God. Time to go to work now. Another, another day in the office. He speaks in a way that no one has ever spoken or before or since at a graveside. 
He says, take away the stone. Lazarus' sister, Martha, protested, Lord, Lord, can we talk about this? This is not a good idea at all. Lord, don't you understand? He's been dead now for four days. Four days, Lord, if, if only you had been here. They didn't have the embalming procedures we have. Decay would have been well on its way. But Jesus insisted, take away the stone. And they took the stone away. Then you know what Jesus did? It's interesting. He prayed. And apparently, he had prayed when they didn't know it. He said in verse 41, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. And then he gave another command. No other person in history could have said it. The only one who could say it would be God himself. And so Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. He had to be very specific, by the way. If he had just said, come out, he would have emptied out the graveyard. <laughs> What's a dead man going to do when he hears the voice of God say, come out of that tomb? Well, the next verse tells us, says, the dead man came out, by the way, still dressed like a, a, a mummy, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Some people say, well, how could Lazarus come out of that tomb when he's wrapped up like a mummy? Did he do like the, <laughs> the mummy hop? Well, he didn't necessarily have both legs wrapped up. He might have had him wrapped up individually so he didn't have to do the mummy hop. By the way, I think I just invented a new dance that will be the craze in America. <laughs> Let's all do the mummy hop. So if his legs were individually wrapped, he didn't have to do the mummy hop. He could have just, he could have just done the, the mummy walk. Somehow, by the power of the resurrection and life who had just spoken, he came out of that grave. What a sight that must have been. Well, let God do what God can do. Lazarus, come out. Let man do what man can do. Loose him and let him go. Wow. What a story. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, I do. How about you? Now, you would think witnessing a miracle like that would have turned every doubter and skeptic into a believer right on the spot. Well, the fact is, after this, many people did believe. Take note of verse 45. It says, Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in Him. I mean, after all, what are you waiting for? Many, but not everybody. In fact, in verse 53, the enmity within the heart of the enemy solidified. In verse 53, so from that day on, they plotted to take his life. So the message is, we all have a choice. It's a matter of head and heart. Even if your head tells you the evidence is there, and the evidence is sufficient to believe, your heart can refuse to believe because it's, it's hard giving the reins over to someone else, even if that someone else happens to be the Son of God. Every believer has faced this issue and fought that battle. 
And I've thought about that, and you know, I've never met a believer who was sorry they had become a believer. Met some sorry believers, but not one who ever was sorry they had become a believer. Never met one who thought the Christian life was substandard. Think of it. Never met one who would say, I was better off before I met Christ and chose to follow Him. I've been a believer and a follower of Jesus since I was 17 years old. Seventeen. I've had enough years and enough miles to put this thing to the test to see if it really works. My friend, I've had over 50 years to examine the life of Christ and His claims. And I've had over 50 years to consider the claims of those who reject Him and His gospel. And here's where I am today. Here's what I believe. Jesus is everything He claimed to be. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this account. A couple of miles outside of Jerusalem in a dusty, insignificant little town out at a cemetery of all places, the symbol of hopelessness and despair and death and defeat. And it was there our Lord gave the world a message like the world had never heard before, and yet the world has so desperately needed. We cling to His words today. We believe them. We rejoice in them. We rest in them. We hope in them. It's a beautiful hope. It's a hope at rest. A hope at peace. And to think that our Lord Himself rose from the dead, putting an exclamation mark at the end of this very statement. I am the resurrection and the life. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you for a living Christ today. My friends, while your eyes are closed, your heads are bowed for a brief moment. If you don't know Jesus today, what more do you need? Oh, my. Layer upon layer of evidence has been presented to us in His Word. And you don't have to go back to an old Bible to find that evidence. You can look around you and you can see the evidence of the resurrection and the life in pew after pew and person after person, living testimonies of a changed life, all because of encounter, encounters not with church, but with Jesus. And if you need Christ, the good and glorious news is he is he's here now he's available to you yeah, he's not been shoved off the scene his power is not diminished he's the same yesterday today and forever and the one who made this extraordinary extravagant promise i am the resurrection and the life also says if you will call upon me i will answer and if you come to me i will save you Bible declares that today is the day for that. It never says tomorrow, never. In fact, of tomorrow, it says, boast not of tomorrow. For no man knows what a day may bring forth. No, the Bible insists today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. So while you're here and God is here and His Spirit works on your heart, now is your time. Now is your time. 
You can make that decision and that commitment right here, right now. I know that because I did it that way and countless others have done it just like that in a church service. You can do that today. And if you'll do it, the the Apostle Paul promises that if anyone be in Christ, he's new. He's a new creation. Old things pass away and all things become new. God will give you resurrection life. That kind of power to live for Him. If you make that decision, I want you to come forward for prayer in a moment. We're going to give you that opportunity as Pastor Brett leads us in worship. Would you stand with me? We'd like to open these altars for anyone, everyone, whatever your need might be today. You might be going through that season of of delay. You might be assaulted by doubts. You need reassurance today. God has already begun to give that to you. Or you may be an unbeliever and you're not in fellowship with the Lord, but you know it's out there and you'd like to find it. You'd like to experience it yourself. You come forward for prayer as well.